Yo, what's up guys? Schizomanic here, here to bring you a Cult 9 episode uh, 3 review. Uh, if we can get this video up to 20 likes, i would be greatly appreciated. Um, sorry about it being a late upload. I kind of got sidetracked with some other shit I had to do, and I finally got around to watching the episode. So this review should be out tonight. Let's get into it, because I just watched the episode, and I want everything to be fresh since I'm coming off of just watching it. So, we kind of, essentially we're kind of going through backstories of all the characters while kind of casually progressing the plot. Uh, and it's, as I said, the pace is slowed down tremendously, so it's a lot more appealing to watch because of it. Um, so, first things first, it seems that the girl, that the, the, the story, we, the random story about this girl who is, who apparently stayed with her brother's corpse for over a year... We finally have a person to tie that to. That's the black, that's the curses girl. That's the girl who I'm now going to refer to as Rhea, which I believe is her, for her first name. Rhea, the Rhea that we've been seeing in the last two episodes who got the weird cut up skull hair thing in, the, in her mailbox and uh, all this other weird shit. And apparently talks to demons is the same girl that maybe like a year, I guess, prior to this anime starting, was living with her dead brother's corpse. We also find out that she had it kind of rough with sexual harassment from her teachers, bullying from fellow classmates, and then on top of that getting sick to where she needed a transplant, which I believe was of her kidney, which unfortunately is the operation that led to her brother's death, which is why right afterwards she stole his body and hid it and hung and like live with it for 10 years now they don't go full on exaggerate it like she's lost her fucking mind they actually take a really weird route when they do they do the whole confronting scene which you don't really understand as a confronting scene until you realize oh he's already dead like you like you, i knew this was the situation but i was trying to figure out when they were going to transition from him being alive to being dead and me not realizing he's been dead the entire the entire flat all well, the most of the flashback i saw you see of him he's already dead a lot of it is just delusion she made up in her mind because she's been so asphyxiated on him that was like the only bright spot in her life and the brother we don't really get to know too much of but we just know that he cared about her and gave his life so she could live and apparently which tells me that whatever she's doing with these demons probably has something to do with her brother if i had to take a shot in the dark it might be something along the lines of trying to revive her dead brother we also get a decent amount of scenage with uh the yaoi uh dojin artist which i believe her name is rikaka rika i think or rikaka not totally sure i gotta hear her name if you don't ririka i'm not sure um there's not much going on except it seems to be that her dojins seem to be kind of predicting the future and the detective even mentions how he seems to be the detective in the story of her dojin on top of the fact that the blood code message was written not was written not only in her dojin what was also written well, which what also came to pass in the form of the like the first fucking episode. So it seems like the three girls we've been focusing on the most, um, which I uh, I can't think of her name. Miura, ah, uh, fucking the one the fortune teller that hangs out with Gamon in the first episode. She can see the future in some through cards. It seems like this Rika can see or re Rika can see the future through her dojins and maybe Rhea can see the future or she has some type of black magic powers being able to, to grant curses but she's not trying to do like death death you know a death flag sermon um and then we have our big breasted main girl who seems to just be out of the loop right now as as well as Gamon for that matter because we get a little bit of the Chichan, you know, her missing story, which is that she's just walking down an alley, which bitches need to stop doing this. Stop walking down alleys by yourself at night and runs into this weird guy who fucking supposedly kidnaps her. Uh, the devil thing we saw in the preview of last week just turns out to be a dream sequence, although they do show a scene of him being followed by someone in a mask. 
This is why I'm confused about the end of the episode, because the end of the episode makes it come off as if he was in a dream sequence the entire time. My question is, how much of that was a dream sequence? Because if the whole thing was a dream sequence, why did you show a guy in a mask following him? Especially because it just seems like a random thing to show. I'm not totally sure. But we're starting to see the connections, how Sarai's father was, I guess, the guy... That, and we already knew this part, that Sumikaze, the girl with the glasses and who's in the occult shit, was really in following of Sarai's father uh, as the one who also is connected to him because I, cause she was his editor, I believe, and that's when you get all these little minor information tidbits. It seems like he also... Sarai's father also seems to want to, like, bridge the gap of proving... The existence of how the occult plays into human life in some way or shape or form. Not 100% sure. It's all relatively interesting stuff, but it's kind of confusing. So, in breaking it down, Rhea, she, I don't know how she knows the story of Rhea other than I guess she just researched it. And Rhea probably is doing something in correlation with her brother. That seems to be her trigger. Ririka or Rikaka, I'm not totally sure how you pronounce her name or if that's how you pronounce her name at all. She seems very weird. She seems to have, she just seems to draw inspir from inspiration, but seems somewhat oblivious. And oh, thank God, she's the only character who draws into attention. You look like a fucking middle schooler, and you're supposedly like out of a, a college graduate. And so I'm thinking there's a plot reason why he looks so young. The, fa the fact that they finally addressed that he looks young, even though he's supposedly a cop, that. Probably, there's probably a correlation with why he looks the way he does and his obsession. Well, not really obsession, but the way he also handles things. Because he's like one of those quirky cops that says a lot of roundabout things to get into the truth. The, the Dojin artist, she just seems weird, but not like crazy. But I'm not totally sure because her eyes did flinch when she mentioned that, like, when he mentioned that the code was written in blood as a dying message. At the end, like when the dude died, she did flinch a little bit. Uh, so I think she probably knows more than what she's letting on. There's probably more about her that we need to know. Um, and then at the end of the episode, we found out that the river or pond that they were at when Dojin Girl and the cop were having the conversation was uh, that there have been multitude of bodies of corpses found in that lake. And I think right now it was 51, and there's estimated to be like another 100 and more. So maybe they're all Pokemon trainers because it's 151. Get it? Ha, 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 ha. Yeah, that was really in poor taste. I apologize. Um, <clears throat> it seems like the Gama, it seems like the radio talking to him is going to be kind of a consistent thing. Uh, he's been ducking his friends, so we'll see what happens. Interesting stuff this week. I look forward to Saturday. Any thoughts, comments, or theories you guys have, please leave in the comment section below. Uh, this has been your boy Schizo Man. Life's a game. Play to win. And I will catch you all later. Peace. Oh, thanks for watching.